Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Downtown Design Review Committee meeting. Today is April 19th, 2018. And before we get into today's uh, agenda, I'd like to simply take a moment and recognize that today is the 23rd anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, I myself was not here in Oklahoma City at the time, but um, certainly was very aware of what happened. And since moving here uh, in 2012, have, has really, I've really absorbed um, the impact that that had on, on the community. Um, so actually, if I could, I'd like to pause and just take a moment if, uh, to just reflect on that, uh, maybe consider those who were affected, and um, consider family and friends here today with us. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Uh, as always, please ensure that your cell phones are off or in the silent mode. And we'll start with roll call. Corey Bates. Present. Nathaniel Harding. Present. Charles Ainsworth. Present. Anthony Black. Present. Julie Kriegel. Present. Deborah Richards. Present. Connie Scothorn. Present. You have a quorum. Great. <clears throat> I assume everyone has had a chance to review the minutes from last meeting. Do we have a motion? That was a Harding-Kriegel motion. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The minutes are approved. Moving on to section three, we have three cases withdrawn. Um, just going through item A, uh, 202 South Lee Avenue. Item B, 903 Northwest 4th Street. And then item C, 515 Northwest 13th Street. Those cases have been withdrawn. Moving on, we have no continuance requests and we have no items on the consent docket. So moving into items for individual consideration, uh, we'll start with item 6A, 512 Northwest Broadway. Is the applicant present? Yes, sir. Okay. And we'll have staff uh, introduce the project. Good morning. Um, several of you have been on here long enough to remember when we acted on a CA for the renovation of this building. Um, during the construction, some changes were made and we're before you today to address those changes. The applicant has provided drawings, which you have in your packet, reflecting the um, final, how the building is going to look finally. There were some windows installed that they're agreeing to change out. And if you can look at um, the pictures, uh, specifically there were some um, windows that were installed up on the addition that they put on the roof that were supposed to be single uh, pane single light glass and they had installed some divided light which is the same windows that they put elsewhere and so they've agreed to change those out. Um, the uh, staff had approved administratively several revisions during construction uh, to address some of the other issues that came up for them. I'm trying to get to the drawing. Um, the last time you saw this, you had approved some things, including the screening for the mechanical equipment and different things like that, but we had not taken action on the last items which you have before you today. Um, based on the revisions they've submitted, which would go back to the single light glass as you see here, um, so there's a clear distinction between the addition and the historic structure, um, staff is supportive of the changes they've agreed to do. and the final version which you've got in your packet. And so we've specified um, 
for action revisions to the rooftop addition which would allow them to increase the size of it revise the style and placement and number because they they added a, a window or two um, on both the rooftop and the elevator penthouse um, the architect and the owner's representative is here mr box uh, to answer any questions um, And at this point, if you have any questions of staff, we feel that uh, the changes of the windows will do will go a long way to uh, improve the p appearance of the work they've done. Okay. Um, do we have any questions for staff or questions for the applicant? <clears throat> I have a, a question or two regarding the, the mechanical screen. Um, at that guardrail, if you could. It, and just to clarify, yeah. the mechanical screening has already been approved. Oh, it has. That was approved at your last meeting. Sorry. So that's actually not uh, an item that you're considering. Okay. Um, but just to clarify, it's the, the uh, it's in that back corner, um, the alley corner. So that's the northeast corner. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there, uh, there's a railing up there anyway, and so they're they're putting uh, metal in that. Okay, it's, a, it's an infill too. Yes, it, to it's an infill ahead. that will be um, both on the the east elevation as well as wrapping around the corner. So we're not going to be able to see it. Plus, it's I calculated that it's um, 50 feet. It's it's very high. It, yes, it's up in the air. So if you were on the ground, you wouldn't even be able to see it if you were immediately adjacent to the building. Okay. Is there anyone else in the gallery that would like to speak to this? Any other comments, questions from staff? Do we have a motion? I'll move to approve the uh, following case items on the basis of the project complies with the regulations and guidelines of the downtown design district zoning ordinance as referenced in section C and D of the staff report. Uh, the main building revised rooftop addition and revised elevator penthouse. Second. That was a Harding Blatt motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Application is approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, moving on to item 6B, 527 Northwest 7th Street. Is the applicant present? Okay, and if we could have staff introduce the project. Um, the request before you is uh, for a duplex on 7th Street. Um, currently, the parcels vacant and we were, we're seeing a picture here there is an adjacent um, home that has been constructed since the establishment of the downtown design district which you see on the right um, it, it this um, property is located within the downtown design district within the DBD zoning um, and I just point out on the zoning map normally you probably just flip through it and it's uh, but um, based on some of the comments that you received in your packet um, and you've been getting emailed to you over the last week I wanted to point out the location of DTD1 um, and in this area happens to be Cottage which is um, I think I referenced in the staff report it's literally two lots to the west and everything on the other side of Dewey is in Cottage which does not have the same guidelines and regulations as we happen to have in DBD. So I wanted to point out um, the location. Um, the elevations that were sent to you yesterday are the current ones. As I stated in the email, we were um, working with the applicant so we could clearly we needed to make sure that they were reflective of what they were proposing um, and so you got those emails you got it handed out the um, applicant uh, 
had a glossy version of those today that you were given. The, um, in the staff report, I'm trying to get to what's the best one to look at. Um, in the staff report, the, the discussion that was included dealt with uh, the issue of pedestrian. Um, the proposal is for front entry garages. Um, they would be coming in off of 7th Street. Um, there is a paved alley. We do not require um, alley access, unlike Cottage, which has a mandatory requirement for alley access if, a, if an alley is available. That is not a requirement in um, DVD. And it, it is only a requirement in DTD1 in Cottage. Um, so there are guidelines that speak to pedestrian circulation and amenities and um, protecting of the pedestrians. Um, the sidewalk is actually further away from the curb than we normally would see, but it's a continuation of the location of the curb on the adjacent house to the east. Um, so there will be a, a, about an eight-foot area of green before the sidewalk, between the curb and the sidewalk. With the front entry garages and the fact that it's going to be, the structure is going to be set on the 10, 10 foot maximum setback, you then have the issue of if somebody parked in the driveway, you'd be blocking the sidewalk. Um, the, there, are, there are ordinances against that that are enforceable by the police department. It's not something that we enforce. It is a concern, and we talk about um, issues uh, about pedestrian safety, the pedestrian experience when you walk down the street. Um, but absent a clear requirement saying, no, you can't do this, uh, staff felt that providing you with that guideline, and then, as you see in your staff report, we have the option of uh, if you feel that is it, in, it is in keeping, because we don't have a regulation against anything that they're doing for approval, or if you feel that it is not in keeping with um, the intent of the downtown, downtown design district. Um, we referenced three other projects that have been approved with, with street entry garages. Two recently that you all saw, one was over on uh, Northeast 7th, where we're going to have three houses facing Northeast 7th and then three houses facing the alley that you might re recall. Um, the first one of those is under construction, if you're out that way, just to see. I know at that meeting, one of the, the committee members expressed a concern about what the appearance was going to be with all of the garages, and so I'll just point that out, because I remember that comment that uh, you made. Um, there was one recently for um, left frame loss, which is over at Dewey in California, where they're going to have four garages in, um, entering uh, off Lee, right at the sidewalk, and then two garages on the alley. Um, and prior to that, there was an AA issued by staff back a couple of years ago for a duplex that's up um, between 8th and 9th uh, over on Francis uh, that has one garage that fronts on the street and one that's off a semi-improved alley. Um, and so we reference those in here because they have been approved both by the committee and administratively. And we wanted to point that out. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If you could, um, please state your name for the record and uh, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Richard Labar. I'm one of the uh, partners of uh, Sosa Properties, LLC, which is the owner. Um, I feel a little bit like Gary Cooper in High Noon. I asked my mom to come, but she said she had a book club or something. Um, there, there were, uh, to give you a very brief history on this application, there, were, uh, there was a previous uh, submission which we withdrew and sent back to the kitchen for more fire. And uh, we, we did our best. The initial application would have required a variance. Uh, among other things, it, it caused the sidewalk to sweep forward in order to get closer to the curb. And, uh, and 
more importantly, it, a portion of the original uh, design was more than 10 feet back from the um, property line, um, which we liked. We thought it created architectural interest. But uh, anyway, we, we made a number of changes and resubmitted and, and had uh, digested the objections uh, from several parties. But um, really, there's one fundamental issue, which is sort of the, the I think, the single issue for you all to consider today, which is whether we can or cannot have front-loaded garages. Um, just looking at it as a lawyer would, which is my day job, um, I, you know, I, I, I saw no ordinance nor any guideline that prohibits it. And in fact, as, um, as Griggs pointed out, there's a number of uh, cases, recent cases, in DBD in which um, uh, such applications have been approved. Um, I, I could see it, of course, that Cottage does have uh, guidelines that call for um, uh, entries off the alley for a garage uh, if there is an alley. But we are not in Cottage, and you have to have a point of demarcation somewhere. Ours happens to be Dewey, and these are the third and fourth lots in to the east of, uh, of Dewey. Um, we, there's one thing that, that I, I would say we'd be quite happy to add, and uh, if it can be done by way of an oral amendment today, I would, I would like to do so. And, and that is, we would be very happy to have the driveway be architectural, stamped, colorized, concrete, but have the sidewalk just continue as plain concrete so that there would be a clear visual uh, distinction um, we actually thought, although we were trying to be compliant by having the sidewalk sweep forward, uh, ultimately we decided, even though it might be a few feet further back than is the norm, that it, it's actually safer and a better idea to just continue what's already in existence um, with our, our neighbor, uh, Mr. Copeland's property. Uh, so that's what uh, our new plan calls for. Um, the reason, uh, apart from just the uh, aesthetics of, of the design, why we would really like to have a, uh, the front-loaded garages uh, is, A, because we don't feel that 7th Street is or ever will be anything more than a local street, certainly not a collector. In fact, ACOG doesn't even uh, apparently think there's enough there to, to warrant doing a traffic study, but if you look at their map, on 8th Street, which, if anything, would have more traffic, uh, the numbers are quite smallish, likewise on, on Dewey. Um, but uh, I'm digressing. The, re the main reason we would like to have the front-loaded garages, apart from design, is simply that uh, um, it allows for some amenities in the back yard, which otherwise uh, wouldn't be possible unless you're content to have a detached garage. And that, namely, if an owner would, <coughs> a buyer would like to have a swimming pool uh, or, or other backyard amenities, uh, having a an attached garage in back would pretty much make that impossible. Um, so anyway, that's the underlying substantive reason, apart from design considerations. Um, and uh, not only is there precedent, but uh, it. We do not believe that there is uh, that there is really room, uh, with all due respect for the committee, to impose such a restriction in the absence of a guideline or an ordinance on point. Um, I, I realize there's a number of uh, people with uh, that are stakeholders in this neighborhood that uh, that oppose our application, um, but I don't believe that this is really something that allows for that degree of subjectivity. It, uh, it passes muster with respect to mass and scale and other issues. Um, and the last point is we would also be willing to trim the width of the sidewalk, of, of the uh, driveways. One of the objectors pointed out that collectively it amounts to a 26-foot span. Um, we would be very happy to trim it three feet on either end, which would make it a 20-foot wide uh, because it could be shared by the owners of each side. 
And, and I'm sorry, I, I failed to mention, it's in the staff report that the adjacent house that I previously referenced, they, their access to their garage is from the alley. Um, and the garage is actually, it's not at the alley, it's under the house. And so their driveway is totally from the alley. There is no curb cut in front of their structure. And i sorry I failed to mention that. We, one other thing, if I might, we, we did add uh, five parking spaces off the alley in order to um, reduce uh, any uh, load from street traffic or street parking. Um, but as I say, this, uh, th this is not uh, at all a heavily used street nor anything but a local street. Emerson um, Alternative School is a high school. Uh, I would venture to uh, speculate that there's likely not a single student that gets there and home by foot. Um, I haven't sat outside to make that observation, but I think that's a reasonable inference on my part. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Does, does anyone you. have any questions for the applicant? Is there anyone else in the gallery that would like to speak to this? If you could state your name for the record, please. Good morning. My name is Suzanne Kreidler. Um, I own the building site, the first building site to the east. Um, there's one house in between. Um, my day job is also an attorney, and I recognize that um, not only is there a letter of the law, but there's a spirit of the law. And when I um, thought of building here to live, uh, which is my intention, I did not have in mind um, front-loaded garages, which is I live in the suburbs now and what I had intended to move away from. Um, there are no front entry garages in DBD uh, that I know of, and I would like it to stay that way. Um, I don't want to repeat what anyone else um, has already uh, written or said, but um, I object and I would like it to, I'd like to have alley access to garages. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes. My name is Gary Copeland. I own the property directly adjacent to this on the east side. And just by looking at this picture, you've taken away every all the street parking off the front, decided to move it to the back, and that's the improvement. And I still don't see your room in the backyard to do what you want to do. But my complaint about this is I just think when you move to the east of Dewey, it should be an urban environment. And when we put garages on the front, that's suburbanite. It's, it's not the urban environment that I moved up here for. It uh, changes a lot of things by doing this. On 7th Street, there is no, park, no street parking allowed on the south side. All the street parking is on our side, on the north side of the street. So now you've successfully taken away any street parking with the front entry garages. I really think that the street cars are going to increase the walkability of our neighborhood because we're, a lot of us are going to walk down to the streetcars. Well, if you've been to any, if you've been down Walker, 19th, 20th in that area, there are side entry garages down there and you have to walk out in the street to get around the sidewalk because they blocked the sidewalk down there. And I'm not complaining about that. Those homes are 100 years old, but they're, and like Mr. Labarth said, there are no restrictions on this, but there should be guidelines, and that's this committee's view is, is those guidelines, and I would just like to keep the urban feel to our area. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the gallery that would like to speak to this? Brian Fitzsimmons, 719 North Francis. I live in the cottage district. Um, not going to add much more than agreeing with them. Um, and what's before you today, the spirit of what wins the regulation or a guideline. If regulation 
is the ruling factor, then the purpose of your body uh, is maybe irrelevant because um, it could go to um, what is and what is the spirit of the, of the code. Um, the only other thing I would like to add is looking at the new rendering, I see that there's a solid masonry wall, which I believe might require a variance. So just pointing that out. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the gallery that would like to speak to this? Please. I'm sorry, sir. Um, the, uh, the lots in there are really 25 feet, but everybody owns two, which is, makes it a 50-foot lot. There are five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There are 15 25-foot lots on that block. And notwithstanding the lots that Mr. LaBart's group owned, we have 100% of the people on that block and to the neighboring uh, cottage district against this. You have received letters in your packet, I'm assuming, from all of them. That's all. I know that doesn't change anything, but there's a lot of us that want this, not just a few of us. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, if possible, may I have the record reflect that uh, uh, we are, as I said, very willing to trim the width of the uh, driveway to an overall width of 20 feet and also to uh, uh, be committed to, to having an alternating appearance of the driveway by having it be stamped architectural colorized concrete such that the sidewalk will very clearly stand out. Thank you. Appreciate that. Do we have any any discussion thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I would like to mention I, I don't think that there's one single issue that we're addressing here regarding front loaded garages. The issue to me is safety, which is clearly outlined in here that we're to to make sure that these designs foster safe and efficient pedestrian movement. Now I did go by the school yesterday afternoon and driving up seventh up the up the little incline there. The streets lined with cars, and there were students walking across the street. And this is while school was in session. And so my concern is having cars come in and out of that garage, all of those garages, backing out, whatever, on a, a already loaded street with a probably exceptional pedestrian traffic. I think this is what separates it maybe from some of the other areas is the fact that Emerson School is there, and the kids do come out of that school and cross that street. I saw it myself. So that's, that to me, this is about a safety issue more than anything. Um, I think that the safety issue is important, but I also think that the idea of building an urban downtown is really important. And I think that in Chapter 59, um, when you read the part that says, create a network of pleasant, safe, and connected public spaces and pedestrian amenities, and enhance circulation patterns. This is all about creating a walkable, kind of thriving downtown. And when we prioritize the car over people and movement and interest on the street, then we're not kind of building that future for like an urban environment downtown. Um, the, ED, the downtown development framework also specifically says it's about urban guidelines um, when there is the option of driving off the alley into a garage, I think it's fair to say that it's not supporting the urban idea of building downtown. Any other comments or discussion? I personally um, don't know where to land on this quite yet. Um, I, I see both sides of the story. Um, I think the way the building is designed um, overall uh, is urban. Um, the balcony at the second floor comes to the property line. The distance from the sidewalk to the face of the garage door uh, per the drawings is 17 feet 6 inches, which is 6 inches shy of a typical parking space. Um, I think stamping the, the concrete in a different appearance to 
delineate that space um, provides a, a condition where a car could pull up to the garage door and not uh, cross the sidewalk. Um, I do completely agree um, in reducing the width of those curb cuts down to 20 feet uh, to offset um, the distance of traveling across those drives and maintaining as much as possible for on-street parking. Um, and at the same time, I understand um, the idea of um, prioritizing the pedestrian experience. And the design is presented um, prioritizes the, the experience of the vehicle uh, as it enters, enters the, the residence. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm torn. <laughs> I think that one of the things <clears throat> that needs to be looked at is when we look at these papers, we see uh, feet and inches, and we're talking about exact numbers. But in reality, when somebody pulls up, they will pull up and they will leave plenty of space to walk in front of their own vehicle if they're going to go someplace. Uh, I think that the case of the sidewalk being blocked would be more often than the case of somebody pulling up to not block the sidewalk because they're thinking about what's behind them. I think that our job is to, one, support an, an urban environment and a pedestrian friendly environment, but I think the issue of safety is, is the key one here. And if we're putting a design forward that we see where the potential for an unsafe situation would be present, I think that we have to speak out and in, in specifically to that, so um, I think that the I think that this is pushing the limits of what could be safe, especially and I think the fact that the the building line, the setback line, is set so far forward. I do agree that the intent would that there would not be front loaded guard garages in this location. That's that's the way I see it. Any other thoughts? Anyone else from the gallery again? Do we, do we have a motion? I, I have a thought. I mean, it seems to me like that we're kind of coming full circle here as a community. And um, if you look at the historic neighborhoods, all the parking is behind the houses. I mean, here it chills. And I do agree that we're moving toward a more pedestrian uh, friendly environment. and. Um, and I just think that if this thing is front loaded, it is going to be a safety issue. And not only that, um, from the school across the street. So, so I think that um, I think you need to reconsider where the entry is for the garage. To the rear. <clears throat> so. I guess at this point we we have um, we'd be looking for a motion or otherwise um, you know based on uh, maybe some of the feedback that's that's been discussed today um, is there a consideration to potentially continue the case? Um, well, Mr. Chairman, we are as I say we're we're very happy to make those two changes we've discussed, and I think. By having read them into the record, that's understood, hopefully. Um, and so, actually, although I think I can read the tea leaves, we still would just like a vote. Okay. If there's no other further discussion, we'd be looking for a motion. I move to deny the application on the basis the project does not comply with the regulations and guidelines of the Downtown Design District Zoning Ordinance as referenced in Section D of the Staff Report. There's a Harding-Kriegel motion. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Application is denied. Moving on to Item 6C, 330 Northeast 1st Street. Is the applicant present? And if we could have staff introduce the application. 
This is a new hotel, six-story hotel, just north of Bricktown and just south of Deep Deuce. But it's uh, so, although it relates quite a bit to Bricktown, it is zoned DBD. So it's a vacant site. Some of you may remember many years ago another hotel was proposed on this site. And uh, I don't remember how far it got in the approvals process, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't ultimately approved and it wasn't built. Staff report uh, calls out a f just a few issues. One, uh, the design of the main entrance ramp off of Russell and Perry, and another, the relative scale of the building compared to the townhomes across the street to the east and the uh, condos across the street to the north. But other, in terms of uh, the heights allowable, the materials um, all meet uh, the guidelines, the setbacks, and the amount of fenestration um, meets all the guidelines. Uh, yes. Good afternoon or good morning. Tim Johnson with Johnson Associates here on behalf of the applicant. Um, we've been working with the staff on this uh, and have continued this case a couple of times for the purpose of uh, adding detail and clearing up a few questions. Um, probably the biggest question relative to the placement of the entry into the building. Uh, this is, if you've been out there, there's a considerable grade change at the intersection, so right on the radius of the southwest corner of that intersection, it's the highest point. And then it goes quickly down both south and to the west. Uh, because we are providing uh, structure parking as part of this project, it was important to get the entrance, entrances where we could work. Uh, the initial plan provided two entrances uh, on the north side, but because of the grades, we couldn't get them to work, so we went back to a double single entry. Um, the, the tower or the corner of the building, the rounded uh, corner of the building, was purposely done uh, as part of the interior finish of the building, which is uh, they have a bar in the round of that, or they have a circular stair that goes around that, the tall windows letting in all the natural light. Uh, and then their restaurant is immediately south of the corner. So that's why the front door is where the front door is on the uh, east side. Uh, the staff had mentioned a couple of things. Um, uh, the staff report does mention that we may come back in the future with a, uh, a new application to put a valet drop off on the uh, west side of the street, east side of the building. Uh, but that's not part of this application, but we purposely had been working around not having trees that we'd have to take out later. So we agree with the staff that we would come up with an integral planter along that east face of the building and include that in the final drawings to allow for landscaping along the east side. Um, and then the uh, other uh, comment was relative to the finish on the ramp side. Uh, the owner has agreed to make it uh, faced with the same brick that's on the building. So it'll be more uh, blend-in condition. Um, I don't know if anybody signed up to talk about this. We did reach out to a couple neighbors so uh, and have had ch changed, exchanged a few emails is all. And um, before the meeting, staff distributed another uh, comment we got from a nearby property owner. And if you'd like us to address that, we can. Um, we think that the elevation of this building is well within the guidelines and the framework of the downtown area with regard to the recommendation of minimum three, three stories. Uh, when opposing, uh, it's a two to one increase. So we're at six. The townhomes across the street are at three, uh, very tall three stories. Um, so uh, I can add to that if you'd like. And have we have we touched on um, the staff had a, a second recommendation of an integrated planter box? Yeah, I mentioned we agree, we we do agree to put that in on the okay. east side of the building. Thank you. 
Uh, there's a recommendation from staff to uh, incorporate an integrated planter, bo planter box on the, uh, that would be the east facade, yeah, where the, the mouse hand is right now, um, to, to, as the grade drops off, those windows become much higher relative to the pedestrian. So a planter box at that location to, to bring that scale back down. It would probably be a, like a seating edge with landscaping behind it. And this kind of gets more into operations, but the, the comment about the five-foot ramp not being maybe wide enough for multiple cars is anticipated you might get more of the um, more people using the entrance from the parking garage. Is yes. that is that expected? I mean, is there going to be bellmen? I mean, is that going to be an operation kind of like you see uh, for, thank you from the parking garage? I meant to bring that up, yes. Uh, so it's a, it's a dual entry garage, there's entry and exit, but when you pull in the garage, there is a loading and unloading zone in there so people can unload their bags and there's an entry in that location. And they do anticipate having a bellman there. Um, so we don't anticipate this front door being used by uh, people that are staying there as much as people that may be visiting the restaurant there or visiting a, a, a person staying there. Uh, and then as I mentioned, we, we may come back later and add that drop-off uh, valet zone uh, which would squeeze that the walking through distant uh, parking, sorry, sidewalk width further. So we want to keep it at least five or six feet wide. Do we have any questions for the applicant? I have a question about the material on the um, kind of first two floors. Is that a cinder block that is? Ceramic base. I think there's, yeah, there you go. Yes. That, so the, the it looks like a jumbo it brick. Something like, um, like a ceramic or a brick or something. Yeah, it's like a glaze. Glaze. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's kind of a semi-gloss finish. We have samples, but they're 150 pounds. We didn't bring them. If I could, I'd like to maybe dig into the, the front entry a little bit. Um, as presented right now, it, um, I, would, I would have concerns about maybe the, the functionality of it, um, certainly, and then the, the appearance and scale of it, uh, as it as an emphasis to the entry and really signifying that as an entry. And I understand um, the width constraint is being guided by the potential for a, a valet drop-off. Um, that is Russell Perry, right? Um, Russell Perry, as it, as it stands right now, is wide enough for two single lanes of traffic and two uh, lanes of on-street parking. And so, if, if you were to encroach on the site and develop a valet drop-off, you would inherently be removing the on-street parking from that location. And you would end up with a drive aisle, a large gap, and then a valet drop-off inside the site. And so from, from the stance of a you know, valet drop-off, I would see the existing width of Russell Perry providing an opportunity to place that drop-off where there's on-street parking right now, because you'll never have both in the same spot. And doing so would allow you to keep the curb at its current location uh, and provide you the 20-so feet width to design an entry uh, for the building that um, maybe enhances that experience, uh, is a little bit more functional when you consider luggage, things like that, um, and becomes a better identifier for the entry to the building. Um, Can you go to the site plan? Right there. 
So you can see from the back of curb to the property line where we're, we're pushing all the way up there, um, it's probably, I want to say it's 20 feet. I think there's a dimension there. So from your perspective, um, when you say that needs to be a little wider, are we talking double, like 10 feet? I mean, is, what's the concept? Um, we well, have a lot of utilities and stuff out there, too, that we can't encroach on. Uh, you can see some of them on there. but So we're going to be limited, I think, to no greater than 10. Uh, and he, the owner just wants to be safely away from the overhead power that can't go away and the many buried utilities that are right there under the surface. So. I, yeah, I, I don't know all the details to, to you know, prescribe a specific dimension, but um, I think if there's, if there's a consideration to simply converting the Arn Street parking, the space for Arn Street parking to be the valet drop-off, um, that allows more flexibility in the design of that entry. Um, and I think anything larger than it is right now would, would benefit the entry sequence. So the, <clears throat> I hear where you're coming from, I'm, and as much as I do not want to take another continuance on this, the, I can't answer the question exactly as to what traffic would talk about with regard to uh, valet without the indention of the drop-off. Um, you can see on the uh, east side of Russell Perry there is, as part of the hill, there was on-street parking added, mm -hmm. which created that space. Um, I'm not positive that Russell Perry is wide enough to allow uh, us to take out that space with hatching or whatever to create the valet drop-off. Um, Unfortunately, I can't answer that today, but I would agree that we would work with the developer and um, create a, try to create a wider ramp. I understand the, the desire, and uh, I think there's probably a way to get that and not re reduce a, a safe sidewalk width from the curb back to the west. Is it, is it a situation where potentially, I'm not saying it will, but Potentially, the project could be approved with the condition that the the uh, entry and kind of drop off design be revisited. Yeah, well, I was going to say it almost certainly will be revisited because the plan as presented does not include the drop off. So, as presented to you today, it actually assumes on some level that people are <coughs> are using the on street parking to unload because. Because what is proposed is paving, you know, is the full 22 foot width to the curb. So when, after um, the consultant gets back with traffic commission and public works and works at all that, they they will have to come back to show how it's going to work with the drop off lane. If if in fact it it does work. I'm I'm I guess I'm talking more specifically about that ramp and stair that is in today's application. If that ramp and stair could be um, almost held or that portion could oh. be continued. Um, yeah, yes, we, we, um, we enumerated, um, yes, we enumerated it as a separate case item, 3C. So uh, yes, that item could be continued or conditioned, however you want. Sure. Yeah. I have a suggestion. Uh, I think we could, we could agree to widen it to 10 feet. And if an adjustment to that needs to be made based on the valet drop off, we can make that as part of the street application. You know, whatever, it may drop a foot or something, but I, I think there's room to do that. And I would agree to do that. Okay, so there's, <clears throat> I just want to kind of pull this all together. There's a staff recommendation that the side of the ramp be constructed of materials to match the building uh, instead of concrete. And then the applicant has um, 
committed to increasing the width of the the entry, the, the stair and the ramp to the realm of 10 feet pending um, detailed investigation. I would agree with that. Okay. <clears throat> Do we have any other, any comments or, or questions? Do we have any, yeah? This, this project came up um, eight years ago, nine years ago. This may be the most patient developer I've ever seen. <laughs> Um, but compared to the original, and I may be one of the only people that remember that design, this thing is light years ahead of, of that. And I think um, the guy, the, they have really tried to integrate this design into the fabric of the of what's the other projects down there. So, is there anyone else uh, in the gallery that would like to speak to this project? Please, if you could step up and state your name. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name's Michael Ming. I'm a resident at the Hill, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I've had the opportunity to review the design. It's very impressive. It's a beautiful facility. Unfortunately, what I found is it's incompatible and really inconsistent with both the ambiance and neighborhood attributes of, of both that part of Bricktown and the deep deuce area. The plan as I see it will tower almost 100 feet high at the southeast corner. The first in Russell and Perry design shows 84 feet plus, but if you take the grade change of 11 feet, uh, that makes it almost 100 feet high. Um, effectively, if you look at the elevation drawings, uh, it's not a six-story building. It's really more equivalently an eight-story building. If you put that in contrast to the new Hyatt, which is five stories, and the steel yard development, which is four stories, the hill, which is three stories, and the apartments, which are three stories, um, this won't just be higher than everything else. It will tower above everything else. And with the breadth of the project, all the way out to the property boundaries. Um, while this design may be appropriate for other places, um, it's really anything but a boutique design in this area. In fact, it's just the opposite. Its scale and density are really overly excessive for the neighborhood the way it stands as I listen to the discussion on how you may load and unload and with the street, I would urge the committee to say it's not just change a few feet here. You could dramatically scale back the project. And, and I will say, I am very supportive of the development here. I appreciate the developer's patience. We would like to see this lot developed, uh, you know, in the spirit of, you know, a peaceful coexistence of a neighborhood. I think this would be a great project. But if you compare other boutique hotels, it just doesn't fit the ambiance of the neighborhood. I would say in using the Hyatt Steel Yard and the others, uh, you know, lower in height, lower in breadth, maybe something more in the order of four stories, um, scale back breadth, um, and that also addresses the significant vehicular and foot traffic and activity of the current plant. So with 135 rooms, um, this is gonna generate a lot of activity in a neighborhood that's really not suited for that. So I would urge you as a committee uh, to reject the design, uh, respect the usually significant surrounding developments and investments and property tax base. I believe Dr. Canfield's gonna talk after I did. He made a significant risk capital investment in this neighborhood way before there was economic certainty that his investment may pay off. So for a proposal of this magnitude to potentially impact uh, a development such as the Hill, excluding the Deep Deuce developments, I believe would really send a negative message to developers and it would really be negative reinforcement for Dr. Canfield's uh, investment and vision. It's really not about what you can do, it's about what you should do. Uh, with fewer remaining development opportunities in the area, 
is another large-scale commercial hotel, the right development for this lot. I appreciate your time and consideration and, again, would urge you uh, to go back and, and start over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the gallery that would like to speak to this, please? If you could come forward and state your name. William Canfield, I'm the developer of the Hill, obviously. Um, I've been involved in the Deep Deuce neighborhood for almost a decade now, and I think I have a pretty good understanding of what it's developed into, and I, I'm pretty proud of what's going on. The Hill has 88 townhomes now. The Deep Deuce apartments are very successful. We have Block 42. We have 444 Central. We have a few businesses. But it's really becoming a residential area. And there are no hotels or large hotels there. If you, uh, it's a little hard to, to maybe understand from a flat map, but you know, we call it the hill for a reason. It's, it's about 35 feet high at the top. We have a very large retaining wall before the railroad tracks, and then the Bricktown area is lower. There are hotels and the steel yard development in the Bricktown area, but they're set down low, so we have a four story building or a five story building with the base that's lower. This is about halfway up the hill, and it, you know, it's just too massive a building. Six stories is going to tower over everything else, and um, I just think it's out of place for this. We have lots of other hotels right around there. It's not like there's a major need for one more hotel. Um, if it was a boutique hotel of maybe four stories, that would be one thing. I think the entrance is completely unworkable. We put five parking places um, on the other side of uh, Russell Perry, and um, given the density of the hill, parking, even though every uh, townhome has between two and three garages, uh, garage spaces, um, there still is a shortage of parking whenever there's a ball game or something like that. It's a disaster. And, you know, I can imagine if we have a hotel here, those four or five parking places across the street would absolutely never be available for their intended purpose, the people who live there. Um, there's an awful lot of traffic for 135 rooms. Uh, nobody's going to be coming by streetcar, I don't think. Um, they're going to be coming by at at best taxi, but, but most likely by private automobile. And um, I, I just think it's, it's odd that you would drive into a garage underneath the place to unload. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But, but I think that, you know, and I, I do think that they have made a, a ton of improvements. The, the, you know, brick and everything is a great improvement over before. But the building is just too massive for the position, and it's completely out of character for the Deep Deuce neighborhood. There's nothing else like it. And um, we have a, you know, a lot of residents who live there, and um, it's, it's been a successful de development. Now that we have the steel yard next to it, it's sort of all filling in. And I really think it would be a mistake to build the largest building yet right in the middle of, of the Deep Deuce. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this? If you could come forward and state your name. My name is Rob Chance. I'm a resident of the Hill community. And my property just sits on Russell Perry straight across the street from this proposed hotel. Um, first, I'd like to thank the opportunity to present. I think it's important that the uh, Citizens be able to participate in the planning, and it's, it's important that the uh, that we be able to uh, see how our city appears to visitors. Uh, as you know, the Hill is an exclusive townhome community. Uh, we have uh, townhomes that are range in price from five hundred thousand and some over a million dollars in price. Uh, it's a luxurious community. Uh, even some of the Thunder players have lived there. Uh, so it's by no means cheap 
to live there and we, all of our homes are considered investments. We're uh, concerned about the uh, property value as well as the future development of the hill, which is still currently under development. There's still quite a few to be built. Um, I understand the area that lot is zoned for a hotel and I'm not opposed to what the uh, owner of that lot wants to do with it. He can do it as he wants, but uh, I know uh, years ago there was a, uh, a plan to put a boutique hotel in there and uh, this doesn't appear to look boutique to me. I actually was able to look up the definition of a boutique hotel and uh, that's one which is 10 to no more than 100 rooms in size. And uh, it's usually artsy, it's luxury, uh, it has designer decor, has a high class restaurant in it. Um, usually the rates are greater than $200 a night. And uh, I guess some similar hotels in this area would be like the Cocor, or if you've ever stayed at the Zaza in Dallas, something like that. Um, the current hotel that is planned for the site, it, uh, like previous speakers have said, are, it, it's just massive. Uh, I'd like to look at something out my front window that is at least attractive. Uh, and this one appears to me to look like a warehouse. So it's, I don't think I'd like to really look at that. Um, but uh, uh, if a hotel is going to go there, I, believe, I would like to at least have some uh, input in what it would look like. And, uh, and I'd be more than happy to assist with the development and uh, help with this moving on. But the current plan as it is, uh, I'm in opposition to, and I hope that you all agree. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the gallery that would like to speak to this? Do we have any questions or further discussion? I have a question of the architects on this committee. Um, do you feel this is consistent with the design in the hill? <clears throat> Personally, I've... Go ahead. <clears throat> um, I feel that it, it is compatible. Um, you know, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship of materials, but um, certainly the, include the, the base material here being uh, brick or masonry block um, would fit in with it. Um, regarding scale, um, while it will be larger than uh, what's around it, I don't think it's out of context for an urban site. Um, and the, the surrounding context being within, you know, three to four stories compared to, um, you know, seven stories is not, in my opinion, not something you wouldn't see in an urban context. Um, there's, there's a buffer, you know, of the street as well as the property to the west um, that allows this to be freestanding and not directly adjacent to something of a different scale. Um, so I think that, that helps as well. And when you look at kind of the, the greater urban fabric of the scale of, of buildings in Bricktown, this almost becomes a transitional piece uh, from buildings in Bricktown that are much taller, making its way north into the hill where the structures are at a smaller scale. And also, I think it's, you know, building density downtown is really important for all the um, businesses downtown to make sure that it's thriving. And although I can't comment directly on, you know, the facade and things, I think based on the downtown uh, guidelines, it is following the guidelines. So, and also seems to be working with what other buildings are doing in that area as far as materiality. Um, yeah, so I agree. I think that the scale doesn't have a problem. I'll, I'll also add that I, I very much appreciate a design that incorporates parking within the building. Um, you know, there's certainly 
many other options to handle parking, surface parking, parking garages, things like that, but <coughs> solutions where parking is incorporated in the building and is not part of the street experience. There's, there looks to be three levels of parking in here. Not sure exactly how many spaces relative to how many rooms, but they're parking a lot of cars in here and from the street you wouldn't, you don't experience that. So I, I'd, I'd love to see more designs that do that throughout the city. I also, I, maybe Mr. Johnson could answer. The grade as it rises to the north, one block higher, is there an approximate grade change elevation? You mean from south to north? From south to north. It's about eight and a half feet, maybe a little more. So, I mean, so this building, relative to buildings as they go to the north, it is going to settle down in just as as it goes down into brick. Yeah, the elevation has a dimension on I think of 84, 85 feet. And what is the height of the hill on average? Uh, they're over 35 feet. Over 35. I, I can't tell you. I didn't measure them. But. Okay. All right. Well, I I I think that the I I agree, especially with the comment regarding parking on the inside, and the fact that this building does not really um, showcase any kind of vehicular traffic. It, it enhances um, or it promotes pedestrian activity because you're not seeing um, large expanses of, of parked and areas. Um, I think the building is transitional in height. Uh, it's not as tall as some of the buildings that are down in Bricktown, but it obviously is taller than what's happening as it goes to the north. And material use, I think, is appropriate for this, for this building as well. Um, I see it as being a good transition between the two. Developments. Do we have any additional comments, questions? I'll open one last time. Anyone in the gallery would like to speak to this, please? If you could state your name again. I'll Lord. try. Unfortunately, I have laryngitis. My name is Catherine Roberts, and I live on Russell and Perry. And I think you made an excellent point. I live at the Hill, and are we urban or are we residential? I, um, I have a dog. Everybody walks their dog. Deep Deuce is a historic district. I can tell you the name of the cats of my neighbors. And now we've got new young families moving in with their children. So are we urban? or are we residential at that area? Um, I like to think we're residential. And again, I'd like to, you know, <clears throat> sorry. reiterate what Mr. Ming said. It's the scope, scale, size, and this does not present like a boutique. It presents like a behemoth. And so I'd like the, I'm sorry. I wasn't gonna do this. But all I can think about is I know every dog that's in Deep Deuce and the Hill. I know them all because we're always out walking. And the idea of, I, you know, first thing I looked at in the design was where's the dog, dog park? Because the Deep Deuce and the Hill incorporate our animals and our families. And this is, you know, big city. And I just think it may be a little bit too much for the area. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> so sorry. You're okay, thank you. Appreciate your input. Please, if you could. So Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, just to address your comments with regard to the transition, there are higher buildings in Bricktown. The Hilton Complex, Homewood, Hilton Garden Inn are much higher. There's a natural slope as you go north of building heights down, okay, in contrast to a natural grade that goes up. This building's anything but fitting into that transition. In fact, it carries the height of Bricktown into a residential neighborhood in complete contrast. So I would just offer um, that I would, as I say respectfully, disagree with your philosophy. And again, I would go back to the significant capital investment that an investor with vision before there was anything there 
made in the area and putting in this scale and this density actually is a very negative reward for that kind of capital investment. So thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this? If there, unless there's any further discussion or questions, uh, we'd be looking for a motion. I am not in the position to make a motion. I will um, just want to remind everyone of maybe the beginning of the conversation about the, um, the entry ramp and stair. I'll move to approve the application on the basis that the project complies with the regulations and guidelines of the downtown dis design district zoning ordinances as referenced in section C and D of the staff report with the conditions that an integrated planner box um, is added on the south, south, south half of the building as discussed uh, and agreed, upon, agreed to by the, um, by the applicant, that the side of the ramp is constructed of materials to match the building, again, agreed to by the applicant, and that the width is increased to approximately 10 feet uh, or no less than 10 feet, and if anything needs to be adjusted on that, it will be adjusted whenever um, the on-street parking is addressed. I'll second. That was uh, Blatt and Scorthorn. All those in favor? Aye. All opposed? Application is approved. Moving on to item 6D. 900 West Main Street. Is the applicant present? If you could come forward. And we'll have staff introduce the application. Yes, this application concerns the streetscape in front of the 21C Hotel, Museum Hotel, which is in the old Fred Jones building. Uh, they are proposing to install synthetic turf in the tree planter areas. They actually have already installed it. They weren't aware they needed a CA to do that. And I know uh, uh, the applicant has um, a lot of explanation of, of why they made this choice. Absolutely. And plus, we put together a brief little PowerPoint. By the way, my name is Matt Cowden. I'm the general manager for the 21C Hotel. And uh, appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. Um, we have already installed the synthetic grass and wanted to visit with you about uh, our thoughts on that. And I think each of you has also received maybe a copy of the presentation as well. Thank you, Laura. Awesome. Uh, as, I, as we pointed out, uh, here to talk about the, uh, the recent installation of synthetic grass on the streetscapes on the corner of Fred Jones Avenue and West Main Street around the north and east parts of our uh, building, the 21C building. Um, in this little presentation, I'm going to talk about the uh, primary reasoning on why this solution works, and including the synthetic, uh, oh, thank you, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, including the uh, low maintenance of synthetic grass, uh, being environmentally friendly, aesthetically appealing, and uh, a safer alternative. All right. So uh, the genesis of this, of this all started, um, we had natural river rocks that were in the streetscape before, and there was an incident that occurred uh, in early November uh, just outside of uh, 80G, who are a tenant of ours on the uh, west first floor of the building. And right, side, right outside of their uh, entrance, uh, we had on that morning of November 9th, uh, a homeless individual grabbed and threw several rocks, several of these river rocks uh, in the outside uh, streetscape, uh, many of which were the size of, golf, of softballs, uh, into the large casement window, as you can see, just right outside of the ADG entrance. So uh, as this occurred on a Thursday morning, uh, during normal business hours, many of those ADG employees were incredibly startled and apprehensive, of course, 
uh, as that incident continued to unfold. And uh, some of the ADG employees uh, said that it sounded like gunshots. So uh, immediately following the incident, uh, we went to work. We removed all of the uh, river walk out of the um, uh, of those streetscapes and moved forward with coming up with a solution to ensure that that would never uh, happen again. So what we came up with was uh, synthetic grass. Uh, it's a product that's made right here in Oklahoma by Always Greener. Uh, very environmentally friendly as there's no watering, fertilizing, or weed chemical treatments needed. Uh, it's aesthetically uh, pleasing as well and really represents our 21C brand and, uh, and it stays green all year round and does not fade from UV rays or the sun. So we looked at it as a great alternative. Um, the big question we had too, and, and I know members of this committee as well, is how we compared to other streetscapes in the downtown area. And so we did our due diligence and looked around and there, there obviously is a, a lot of different street, streetscape options uh, in downtown uh, in the area. And we noted that ours was the major takeaway, not only aesthetically more pleasing, but really virtually no maintenance. Uh, once installed, it's year-round maintenance-free. And as you'll see in some of these uh, pictures, uh, and especially in the fall-winter areas, those can look a little uh, more diminished as far as just how, how well they look. So, so we've got a lot of those. So uh, in summary, um, our synthetic grass approach supports the 21 Cs. Invade, innovative, ecological, and the community-minded brand. We're really big into being green, and we think that's a big step forward. Low maintenance, as I said, once installed, uh, it's, it's good to go. Looks very clean, uh, representative of our hotel. Um, Future-focused, uh, very clean lines, and uh, as I said, green year-round. Um, Safety-centered, and that's the biggest piece as we, as, we, as we move forward, is making sure there's nothing there's no softball-sized projectiles that somebody could pick up and throw through a window. Uh, we think it really is, is uh, very much more safe than we had before, of course, and resilient as well. So um, any questions? I have one. Yes, sir. So uh, there are a couple of areas where you've got some trench grates because there's some large rainwater conduits that come down. I don't know if we've had a big rain event since this has been installed, mm -hmm. but is what's below this still able to capture that rainwater? It's not just stopping the flow and it's actually kind of integrated into this, the way that this has been installed to where the rainwater issue is addressed? Yes, sir, absolutely. In fact, uh, I got to see firsthand, they put down gravel, sand, and then the uh, synthetic grass so that there is still drainage that goes down. Uh, to your point, Tony, it goes out into the street and then we put new uh, trench uh, drains right along the curb uh, that install into the wastewater uh, system. So we won't have that flooding we've had it before and everything is, is uh, kind of works together to ensure that that drainage happens. Yep. And we have not had a, unfortunately, a, a good uh, rainwater event yet, uh, hoping this weekend, but uh, to kind of test that out, so. Do we have any other questions for the applicant? Um, so, what, are there alternatives to put in actual plants in those locations? I understand that maybe you thought that some of the other plants along the street didn't look nice, but maybe there's a type of ground cover or plant that it does look nice, um, and or, or is it a problem with the stormwater situation? Because it, it sounds from this that are there some planters that don't have this, or now they all have the turf? They all have the turf uh, going again on the north side of the building all around to the east side along Fred Jones. But they don't all have the stormwater drain, right? Uh, drain no, the, the primary put. trench drain is actually, I, I know if you can see in this photo, but uh, it runs along um, West Main right in front of the entrance of the hotel, uh, forward east towards in front of Marietti's. Um, but uh, well, no, to your question though, we did look at that, but this, again, when you look at the total package, checks off all the boxes as far as maintenance free, um, it, it, no pesticides, it, it's environmentally free, which we were big uh, fans about, it really, and low maintenance. Uh, it I just seemed like, like the low maintenance issue because then it's like saying all plants are maintenance, and so we shouldn't have any. I 
don't know, it seems like a little bit of an odd, I mean, I understand that it's convenient, but I'm not sure if I totally buy that because we need to have plants down. Gotcha. So. Well, from an environmental standpoint, low maintenance can mean no fertilizers, which is good, no chemicals, uh, no emissions from cutting, uh, from glass, grass clippings, um, and, uh, and it always looks good. And that's, I think, probably another big takeaway. It's very aesthetically pleasing. So, But no, I totally understand. So, of course, with that logic, we would just pave the entire city and not plant anything, and then we wouldn't have to maintain it. So, maintenance doesn't fly with me at all. Okay. Um, you have to maintain your hotel. You also have to maintain the outside of your hotel. You knew that when you built it. So, <clears throat> maintenance is not a good reason to have plastic grass in front of your building. I agree that. 21C is interesting and kind of out there, edgy. And if there's any place in this town that fake grass would fly, it would be your place. But I don't want to see this anywhere in particular. Once you put it in, we're going to have it all over downtown. And there's no way, there's no way I would ever do this. There are other solutions that are maintenance, that do involve maintenance, plants. You know, of course, I'm a landscape architect. I think they're a good thing. They actually contribute to the environment. They don't use chemicals to manufacture plastic grass. So I also don't agree with the user environmentally safe. Sorry. So safety-centered, you can use other materials that can't be projectile, smaller pieces of gravel, plants that can't be dug up. So I don't, I don't follow any of your arguments. Sorry. Understood. I was going to say, thank, I mean, I appreciate that y'all have a solution quickly, and I understand that situation, but it just kind of feels like you're kind of giving up, going the easy route on this. And I agree that once we put a lot of plastic grass, it's going to be all over. It's, it's um, I just feel like as creative as a hotel as that is, it seems like you could come up with some fantastic um, option and m something much that would better reflect your hotel than this. Um, I'd be disappointed, very disappointed, uh, if that were the case, that you'd stick with the plastic grass out there. You guys are so much more than that. So, My only response to that is... Um it looks so real, and uh, it is. Uh, there's a lot of, I think, residents that are using this in the residential area. I used to work for uh, MD Building Products. Used to travel to California a lot. Of course, in their drought situation, they use this a lot. It is amazing how realistic it looks. We receive compliments daily from our customers, our guests that come in, that it looks clean, it just it beautiful, and it really just kind of lightens up the uh, streetscape. But. Uh, uh, our, our uh, so far, our comments and responses have been very, very positive. So, so what about um, pet owners that walk their animals across that? Mm -hmm. It's easily cleaned. Uh, you just power wash it, or so you have some maintenance there too with it. Just a little bit, if it ever. Now, of course, we have some construction that's happening, so we're constantly blowing it off. Whenever, but again, it just very quickly. You don't rake it or anything. You just, uh, uh, if you if you have to, it's very easily maintained. So. All right, well, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, I, not, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I, I do agree with um, some of the comments from the committee members. Um, and I do think there is a huge realm of options when it comes to natural landscape that includes options that are low maintenance that would thrive on their own in the shade on the north side. Um, and I'd be very hesitant to set a precedent where this would be allowed because um, I could see it going everywhere at that point. Okay. Let, me, let me be the other side of the argument here. Um, you know, I leased the high tower building and I've been involved with the bid board and uh, we have a lot of different planters with a lot of different materials including Coloradus and Mondo and all sorts of stuff. In my observation, and, and the bid board, I think we're on the hook for uh, maintaining those. And it's been very difficult to maintain those. I mean, they collect, in public areas, they collect cigarette butts, they collect trash. 
I mean, almost daily, and we have a maintenance crew, I walk around the building and pick up trash. And so um, I have seen this uh, grass. It, it looks very realistic. I think it's a real clean look. I don't think it has anything to do with, it, it just seems like in these tree wells that I've seen, they are really hard, even if you're on them on a daily basis, to make them look really good. And as somebody said here, if you're going to put this stuff anywhere, I think 21C is kind of a cutting edge development, and, and I think it, it complements that. So, um, you know, I'm not going to fight this thing one way or the other, but that's just my observation. I think the part that we're, re we're really struggling with here is the issue of precedence, because I do agree with the fact that the things that I've seen in and around 21C are anything but standard out-of-the-box solutions. And standard out-of-the-box solutions can be a lot of the landscaping that we, that is successful. The landscaping that is successful throughout the rest of the downtown area is commonplace, and 21C doesn't do commonplace. So having something unique here, I definitely believe I would expect something unique here. All of the 21C hotels that I've been to, they all have something that's very interesting and unique whenever you walk up to them. But at the same time, I would definitely agree that if it was here, it would go no place else. It wouldn't be appropriate for the, the rest of the city. I also don't know that it necessarily, this is one building but there are multiple tenants. There, it seems like the, that this, it, maybe that maybe if it's, um, it, it seems like it is appropriate if it is something that is tied directly to this specific use, that it's not appropriate for the rest of the streetscape of the city. So um, that's my thoughts. Yes, please. Uh, Claymoss, uh, 1509 Westchester. I'm also involved in 21C Jones Assembly, West Village. Um, in terms of the precedents, um, we have, for all three projects, looked at this material, and it's five times the cost of all the other materials. Um, and so we chose to go in the surrounding areas uh, a cheaper uh, way. And so. Um, it would be kind of the normal streetscapes that you saw, and, and to Mr. Ainsworth's comments, um, you know, going to have a, a full-time, close to full-time maintenance crew to, uh, to keep those up. So from a precedent standpoint, I, I, I would I'd be surprised because of the cost of this material is very expensive. Um, and so it would be interesting to see, um, you know, if other people, you know, uh, do ask to use it. But again, I would be surprised. Uh, a couple of comments, too. Um, we have not, everybody loves it, have made even comments. We had, when the development was originally done, we had kind of the standard streetscapes, and we would get, com not complaints, but, you know, people would say, you know, there's trash or cigarette butts or whatever. And we've had nothing but uh, overwhelming uh, positive response for this. So uh, it was kind of actually exciting to see. Um, sincerely apologize for doing it. Um, uh, without uh, without permission, candidly, I think that was just a total oversight on our on our part. But um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, there are there are other options, and uh, whether they're fitting of, of 21C, um, you know, we could probably argue that. Um, but do think that the the cost and and uh, the cutting edge kind of design uh, fits very well within the 21C brand, as 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 Mr. Cowden spoke earlier. Thank you. Clay had a quick question. You said for the other uh, properties, you're you're doing natural landscaping. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Again, I think we we look like every developer. You kind of look at all the options, and and you know, uh, the surrounding uh, developers didn't want to spend the money. Uh, the surrounding uh, partnerships. Well, I do want to speak again to presidents. Yeah, they probably picked the best. I, I hope you picked the best synthetic grass there is. But that's not to say that it's all expensive and that it all looks good. It doesn't. So once we get this out there, are we going to have brand names that are going to be approved or not? I think that's our problem. 
our job. So then you'll end up with cheap old plastic bags. And anyone can afford it. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this? I just, I just want to say really quickly, like, I, I, I could also imagine that the synthetic grass goes with 21C. And I really appreciate the project. It's an amazing building, amazing project. But, but that wasn't kind of the argument for it anyway. So I didn't hear something about this is kind of a art piece that we're putting here because it changes your perception of what a plant should be. It's, it's just like a maintenance solution. So for me, that kind of raises a question, like, if you did want to propose, have an artist look at these plots and propose, like, some kind of strange grass-like art piece in there, like, I would think that would be really interesting. But the way that this is, is like, this is not an art piece. This is just a maintenance question. It's really good maintenance product, which is fine, but I don't know if I can totally buy the argument of putting the synthetic grass. Unless we have any further discussion, do we do we have a motion? I will move that we deny the application on the basis that the project does not comply with the regulations and guidelines of the Downtown Design District Zoning Ordinance as referenced in Section D of the Staff Report. I'll second that. <clears throat> that was a Scothon Richards motion. All those in favor? Aye. All opposed? Aye. I'm sorry. Can we take a moment and simply clarify the, the motion was to deny. So those voting in favor are denying the application. And so do we need to? So all those in favor? of denying the application, please raise your hand. And then all of those opposed to denying the application, please raise your hand. So the application is denied four to three. Moving on to item 6E, 400 North Broadway. Is the applicant present? You come forward, please, and we'll have staff introduce the application. This application is for improvements to uh, what we're referring to as Pioneer Park. It's that um, unusual triangular shaped area that's immediately east of the Pioneer Building, just north of the new Chase Bank Building where Gaylord and Dina McGee kind of, and Broadway kind of crashed together. The Pioneer Building was previously approved for renovation and is being renovated as we speak. They require a transformer for which they don't have any room on their site. So they have been working with uh, og and &E and the Parks Department to locate it to work out agreements to locate it in this, I'll call it a pocket park. Um, and uh, in order to dress it up and uh, perhaps uh, make it even a, a better amenity for the neighborhood, and they're proposing some um, decorative screening, an architectural feature, some more landscaping, benches, sidewalks. So I will, with that, I will let the applicant. <clears throat> Again, Tim Johnson here on behalf of the applicant, uh, the owner of the, the owner's group of the Pioneer Building. Uh, and I'm going to introduce Scott Howard in a minute uh, to go through the park design. Uh, and we have a PowerPoint for you. But I want to kind of walk you through the process and why we're here. Uh, this whole process started nearly a year ago. when The Pioneer Building was acquired and renovation work began. Uh, we worked with the uh, electrical engineers, og &E's engineers, to find a place to put a transformer. The Pioneer Building historically was connected electrically with, and all the wet utilities were all tied together into one connection 
with the 405 building to the north. So part of our job was to split off the water, split off the sewer, put in separate fire pumps, and put in a separate uh, transformer. So the 405 building has a transformer in the alley, uh, but because of the regulations of OG&E, we couldn't put another transformer in the alley. Uh, there was no place to put a vault in the alley. We investigated at least three vaults that were historically there, one in the alley, and then utilizing the basement of the building as a vault, but none of them meet the uh, open or um, closed enclosure space criteria, which is problematic. Those rules, as you architects know, are continually changing for safety reasons, and it creates a uh, hardship on trying to find a place to put a vault. So uh, we worked diligently with uh, OG&E and, &E and uh, finally came up with the resolution. There was two spots we could put a transformer. One was in the street uh, in the improvements that were done as part of 180 at the southwest corner of the building. It would require us to, to lose one parking spot there, and we'd literally putting the transformer in the street uh, beyond the curb. Um, and so I brought a couple of examples of what those things look like. I don't know if you see that, but this is, uh, this is in the development, uh, the level development. So that was their same option as well. That's where it went. And you can see it narrows the sidewalk, and it certainly is a uh, aesthetic deterrent. Um, and we would be exactly like this if we had have to do that. So we, uh, our second alternative was to try to get an easement from the city parks department to uh, place the transformer in the park. And uh, Mr. Cupper, who was here earlier, but I see Melinda has taken his place, Parks Department worked very hard with us. We started this process last August. And we went to the uh, Parks Board with simply a request, can we get an easement and we'll do some improvements to the park, we'll take over the maintenance of the park. The board somewhat reluctantly approved that uh, with the guidelines that we'd have to come up with a park design that was suitable to the staff and that everybody was happy with. Uh, and so we, that's, we started that. So what you're going to see, the version you're going to see is probably version four or five. Uh, we went through several renditions and then we finally reached a point with the park staff that we can't save what's there. So the park that's there is an underutilized brick structure. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's got some oak trees around it, uh, but it's a, it's a shelter for the homeless. Uh, I bank at Chase across the street. I'm by this park a lot. Um, I mean, that I never see any activity there except for somebody sleeping. And so we thought that, and agreed with the staff, let's just scrape it and start from scratch. And so uh, what, you, what you will see here is an effort that we have made with og e to place this transformer in the only location that they will let us do inside the middle of the park. The only alternative they gave us, besides where you see it here today, is up at the very north uh, west side uh, where the iconic piece will be. They wanted it right there, which is the front door coming down Gaylord into downtown. So we opted to, uh, to design the park the way we have it. And, uh, and, and I know when, when Scott goes through it, it'll, it'll describe some of the items that we've done that I think respond to some of the comments that the staff has made. Uh, currently, OG&E has a 100-foot easement through here. Their fiber line runs north and south through the middle of this park. And so their connection to their own fiber line they have a right to do that. Um, and it's certainly not a first time precedent in front of Mr. Ainsworth's office. In the, uh, in front of the garage, the Arts District garage, there's a transformer the size that we're doing that's right there in the middle of the grass. And, uh, and this is not what we wanted to see in front of the Pioneer Building. So we have an opportunity to redo the park to allow for it to be hidden and uh, in such a way that it's, uh, it creates a very iconic entry. We went back to the Parks Board a month ago with this new design, and it was unanimously approved by the Parks Board. And so we're here today uh, to ask your approval. It does look like the decision's already made. We're arguing going forward, and it's done. But we had to do this amount of work to get the Parks Board and the Park staff pleased. So we basically had to design it several times to get to the point that everybody understood what we were doing. 
So this is not a precedent of designing and then asking, but that's why we're here. Scott. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Scott Howard. I'm principal with HFSD Landscape Architecture. Uh, we're a firm here in Oklahoma City. Uh, as you know, our charge was to uh, design a park to accommodate this transformer. As Tim mentioned, we did uh, have several meetings with the park department, and many of the improvements that are proposed were recommended by the parks department. As you can see, the, the transformer is the uh, white square pad in the center. I'll try to do this and talk at the same time to where you can hear me. This is the transformer pad. Uh, the transformer is a tall vertical element here, about five and a half foot tall. The red or the pink line here is kind of the, the requirements that og &E requires for their clearances to be able to use and access and, and work on the transformer. We're, we've located in the center mainly because of, you know, we looked at you know, where else could we place this and, and have the green space I don't want to say look normal, but look appropriate. You know, with the scale, uh, we felt it was it was best positioned in the center with a beautiful decorative screen that hides it so that nobody walking by will ever know what's in there. They will see this decorative screen that is very uh, attractive. og &E will have access on the west side with double gates. And I'll go into a little bit more detail of the screen here in a minute, but, you know, initially our park some of the concepts, early concepts, just had the a sidewalk connecting to the two existing handicap ramps that connect to the crosswalks at Dean McGee and Gaylord and uh, Broadway. And in talking with Parks, they, they said, well, can we expand that? And we said, certainly. You know, so we've expanded a, a six-foot sidewalk around the, the screen. We've also added uh, some granite chips in this area. We've got five benches. Uh, Parks Department asked if we could do some lighting, so we've got some low-level bollard lighting throughout the park. There are several existing street lights that will be maintained around the, uh, the park edges. Um, so that's really not going to change. And then the other element, this is kind of a gateway into the north side of the downtown area coming north from Broadway. And uh, Parks Department and Park staff thought, well, what about doing something iconic at, at the north end of that to signify it's a gateway. So we had this iconic feature design uh, right here. It's a two foot diameter uh, columnar element. Uh, Laura, can you go ahead? We've got some renderings. This, let me, yeah, that's, that's kind of what the iconic element would look like on your screen. And uh, basically, it's based, the, the letters of O, K, and C cut out and formed in a circular column. So there's a lot of airspace between them, but you see the letters in the general shape built up with a planter around it. The shape of this planter from the top is actually a, a, a coin design that's at the top of the Pioneer Building. So we've tried to pull some of the architectural features of the building down into the park. Um, it would be planted with perennial flowers and, and ground cover. And then the whole tip of the uh, park island is uh, uh, an evergreen ground cover. Uh, mainly, uh, and it's also burned up to, again, enforce, reinforce the significance of this gateway to where it's elevated, it's very prominent, uh, it's about 10 foot tall, uh, so very attractive. So uh, let's go back to uh, the screen itself. Uh, stay right there. Uh, this is kind of a section view. Uh, if you look in the northwest uh, corner of the slide, that kind of shows where the cut, section cut occurs. And you can see in the middle, the dark uh, element is the transformer itself. The screen, uh, this uh, slide shows six and a half foot. But as we progressed into the development of the plans, we realized that we could do a concrete curb beneath and get a little bit more height. So we're proposing seven foot tall. And I believe we have some drawings that, that refer the, the updated uh, dimensions. But the, the diameter of this circle is 32 foot across. And then you can see the six-foot sidewalk and, and uh, the green space separating the sidewalk uh, from the curb line. So again, it's very, from a pedestrian standpoint, it's a very safe atmosphere and environment pulling all the sidewalk edges in so you're further away from traffic. 
Um, we do have some decorative pots um, for uh, seasonal color plantings. And let's go on into the next slide. These are, again, some uh, renderings that kind of show the iconic features there at the, you know, exactly. And then the decorative screen is the element that's a little bit larger. Uh, you can see there are six, uh, what we're proposing are sugar maples, very hardwood uh, tree, uh, very durable tree, will last many, many decades, and they encircle the screen, so uh, really adds uh, some beauty to the park. Go ahead and get a little bit lower view. And the intent on the screen was, was it's kind of a positive negative thing, where we took the letters OKC and pluck them out of the screen, and that's what kind of becomes the architectural iconic feature. The screen will be um, ACM material. It's an aluminum composite material, very flexible to where you can shape it in, in a curved form. Uh, it'll be internally lit with RGB uh, colored LEDs, so it'll be color changing opportunities. So this is going to be a very significant attraction as far as a visual element in this park. And, uh, well, I think we have a nighttime shot, too. Uh, I, would, I do want to point out that they, the gates right there, they're not shown to have the letters, but the full screen has letters and lighting. So there won't be any blank side that looks like, well, that's a gate. And that's kind of a, the nighttime shot. And then some of the low maintenance materials. Again, the owner or the developer has agreed to maintain this park in perpetuity. Um, this will be a fescue turf. Um, we'll, we are going to slightly berm up the edges, probably no more than a foot in height, but this is the more significant berm around the uh, elevated planter. Um, we also have some, some uh, drawings that we've got out for pricing right now. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention is in the lower right-hand corner, anytime you have project lighting, you know, site lighting, landscape lighting, typically you've got to have an electric meter and a, and a bunch of ugly support boxes on an electrical rack. Well, if we didn't have this screen, it would be standing out in the open. So we're able to place that inside so you won't see an irrigation controller or any other apparatus. It'll all be screened inside of that circular decorative component. And then you can see the detail of the, uh, the screen there uh, with cutout letters. It'll be fully irrigated as well. So it's basically a brand new part. On the construction of the screen, if I'm reading this correctly, there is a panel, a perforated panel on the outside of the wall Correct. that has the OKC letters. And then there is a solid panel on the back side of the wall. That is correct. So from a visit, if you're standing next to this, there, is, there would be zero visibility even through those letter perforations to see the transformer or the rack or anything. There's a solid barrier. You would never see it. The, okay. the back panel it will be a white color, a very bright white. And then the exterior color of the cutout panel is a, a bright silver metallic. So in the daytime, it's very attractive night, the white will help uh, make the lighting pop. Okay. Do we have uh, any additional questions for the applicant? So the, um, the landowner or the, the property owner is, is maintaining, I'm sorry, remind me about the maintenance as far as the park is concerned. Uh, the developer has agreed to not only fund the development of the park, but to maintain the entire that includes the screen as well? Everything in the park. Because I can imagine maybe the, the white paneling over time, you know, the way the rain would kind of run down the letters, it might not look as good if not maintained. Right. And the column is, is see-through. The, the, the fencing is, is not see-through, you know, but the, the column. But the, the architectural iconic feature, yes, is, uh, can you go back to, well, you yeah, yep. there you go. Yeah. It's very translucent. Uh, again, not, not intended to be overbearing, but something very noticeable at, at the entrance from the north. 
Is the perforation, is it actually physically open? There's no kind of, um, it, what's the distance between the perforated panel and the, and the? Six inch. Six inches. And if debris blows in, is there a way that that can be maintained? At the top and bottom of the back side of the panel, there are removable bands. The okay. ACM material only comes in specific widths by 16 foot length. And we, we intentionally did that not just for access for maintenance to get leaf removal or leaf debris, but also to maintain the LED lighting. So. I think it's a pretty creative way of hiding a transformer. I think we should put them up all over town. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one question on the landscaping, and that's the fescue. I, I don't know why we're not just using Bermuda, because fescue takes water. Understood. That was a developer request. On, yeah, I would I would see that as a maintenance issue too, considering how much traffic there is right here next to it. I would think the Bermuda would hold up a lot better. Scott had originally proposed the Bermuda, but our developer, who also sponsors many islands and other parks in town, he has his own landscape crew that. He hires just to maintain his public spaces and around his buildings. Um, he prefers the fescue because it looks so much better. You know, similar to the island in front of Penn Square Mall, that fescue just pops with the seasonal colors. That's what he wants. That's what he wants to achieve here. Do we have any other questions for the applicant? Is there anyone else in the gallery that would like to speak to this? Good morning, PDRC. It looks a little different from the last time I was here. My name is Anthony McDermott. Uh, I have a business at 415 North Broadway called Tap Architecture, and I live at 100 Blakeney Place in downtown Oklahoma City. Uh, I'd like to make some comments this morning that uh, some specific to this project, but uh, some comments I think that need to be addressed ongoing with this whole transformer placement and downtown Oklahoma City. Uh, I live at 100 Blakeney, which is a new street next to a public park. Um, I purchased the lots a long time ago and uh, was in the process of building my home, designing and building my home, when og &E placed uh, two massive transformers five feet from my property line from my front door. So um, there was obviously a breakdown in the approval process. I was not informed that those transformers were going to be there. Um, the Parks Department was not informed that those transformers were going to be there. And so I come to this meeting with a little bit of a poisoned attitude. But I also come to this meeting uh, to, to sort of advertise the fact that this is not an isolated incident. This is not going to be um, a, a, a one-off issue. This is going to be a recurring problem because if og &E refuses to put their transformers in vaults in downtown Oklahoma City, we're going to see a population of transformers in downtown Oklahoma City. This particular case is fortunate that there are some options, one of them being across the park in Pioneer Park, the renamed Pioneer Park. I actually like them to call it uh, Tap Architecture Park because we're okay. like right across the street as well. But uh, this, is, uh, this is an issue, and this is an issue that's going to come before you again and again and again if og &E cannot find another answer to their transformer locations because this is a, this Pioneer, as you know, was a part of the 405 building, uh, the AT&T complex. But there are going to be other redevelopments downtown, and there are going to be other requests for transformers, and there aren't always going to be parks across the street to place those transformers. So you will be faced with this problem in an, on, in an ongoing way. Okay, that's my first comment. My second comment is I was not given notice of og intention to put transformers five feet in front of my house. 
and I was not informed of the intention to put this transformer across the street from my business. So something has to change there in, in, the, in, in the way of notification. Uh, it's just not right. Um, the, uh, so I question the process, and I question ongoing, uh, this ongoing placement of transformers above ground. Uh, for parks, I think this is, a, this is a Faustian bargain, right? We all know that parks is underfunded. We know that they can't afford to maintain all the parks that they have. The park in my neighborhood is maintained by the Homeowners Association. I think it's great that these guys will maintain this, this park, but it is a bargain. It's a Faustian bargain, okay? Parks can't afford to maintain it. Someone comes along and says that they will maintain it, but we need to put a transformer on it. Well, would parks prefer that they maintained it and redesigned it without the transformer on it? Yes, I'm pretty sure that from the conversation I've heard that took place, yes, they would love for someone to volunteer to take care of this park and redesign it, but the transformer was just part of the deal. Okay, so one of the things that hasn't been mentioned about this design is, the, is that you can see down, you can see down onto this transformer from all the surrounding buildings. So from the Pioneer building, which the, these developers are developing, from the 405, which as yet does not have a new owner, and from my building, uh, Chase is kind of a low-rise building, but there will be high-rise buildings across the street uh, in, in development. So if you're above the ground, you're going to be able to see this transformer, uh, this circle with the transformer in it. That's just one observation. Uh, another observation is from the street, uh, from cars in the street, and certainly from pedestrians adjacent to this screen wall, you cannot see around it. You cannot see through it, you cannot see around it. And I, I, I'm just not sure that that's gonna be a very comfortable sidewalk when you're rounding that, that uh, when you're rounding the screen. And, and, and you're not gonna stop homeless people <laughs> populating this park. Uh, it's just gonna happen, it's just an issue. And there are nice benches here and the homeless are gonna sleep there and so I don't, it's, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a traffic island is what it is. And it's a difficult, it's a difficult design to manage. Uh, I would say that on balance, I just think it's really unfortunate. I think that the park, the park design without the screen, great. The fact that the owners are gonna maintain it, great. The fact that you have to put a transformer in, in the middle of it with a massive screen around it, I think is probably, is just unfortunate. And I cannot, and I cannot believe for the life of me that there's not another solution and a better solution to placing a transformer. So I think you're gonna see a lot more of these cases come along. I think that they're, they're or maybe not. I don't even know if you're in the process of being informed where transformers are gonna be placed. But, but they're coming. If og &E refuses to put them in vaults, and I'm not sure that that is the case. I think that og &E's preference is they're above ground, but, the, but, but, but there are a lot of transformers in downtown Oklahoma City and they're all underground. So, it, you know, it's, it's people with a higher pay grade than mine and probably all of ours needs to address an issue, a much, much bigger issue, which is that og &E seems to be able to willy-nilly place transformers where they want without any kind of process or, or, or notice to adjacent owners. And I am one of those, and this is the second time, and I don't appreciate it. So those are my editorial comments. The design, I think, is great. I think the transform in the park is awful. And uh, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a, um, I'm just kind of wondering out loud, I don't know if anybody here has the answer, but is there maybe a safety issue? And I, I imagine that this is a locked, you know, it's inside of a self-contained um, unit that's, that's locked. But it, I can imagine either, you know, people just, younger people goofing off and kind of going over to the side of that, or, you know, homeless people going, you know, kind of going to that area to be in this little haven, this little seven foot 
tall. Uh, that it, that it, there's nothing over the top of it, so there's nothing stopping somebody, either a curious or a desperate person, from climbing over the top of it. Is that a safety issue? Has that been considered? And really, there is no solution to that besides either not doing it at all or just putting something over the top of it. But has that been thought about by in the design criteria? It was discussed at length with the OGE representatives, uh, just like any other transformer on the street that you can walk up to and put your hand on. This will have the same safety built-in safety measures. So you know, somebody'd have to be trying to pry it open, you know, to, to do damage to it. Uh, it is. Uh, Gated and locked. It'll have an OGE lock on it, so OGE will have the access. Uh, but OGE felt comfortable that they were fine with it, with this uh, behind the screen. They actually did come to the parks board, and they were hit with a lot of questions. So, but they they're supportive of it. I think to uh, Nathaniel's question is more to the design of the screen itself. And given those perforations, was there any consideration about people being able to scale that? Well, I suppose anything is possible. I mean, if somebody wants to get in, they're, they're going to get in. Um, we uh, tried to detail the lettering um, as vandal proof as we could. You know, that's why it has the appearance of kind of the stencil Look, because with an O, you've got that internal letter. You've got to support it somehow. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure somebody, if they want to get in there, they can get in there. Uh, if if we need to add some uh, step, like a step ladder to get out, if, if there's an issue of concerning you know safety, if you get stuck. You know, I, I'm sure we could provide that. But um, I, I think it's a very maintainable screen and obviously decorative, so I don't know if I fully answered that. Yep. I actually hadn't thought of that until you said that. Now I'm more scared. So, there, <laughs> so, so there's a way to get, now that you point that out, there's a way to get in, but there's not a way to get out, you know, so I can. Well, and again, I mean, the letters are, you know, turned at various angles, so it's not like just like stepping right on up and climbing in, um, and they're, they're only about this wide, so as far as the letters. So I, I think it would be a challenge to get in, but again, if, if somebody wants to climb a fence, they can climb a fence. Uh, but most fences, they, the way that you get over is the same way you get back. And then in this case, if they got in it, they, there, there's no way to actually get to scale back out of it. I, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. I guess it depends on how tall they are. You know, if you climb a six-foot uh, wrought iron fence that has pickets on it, well, you, you may get over it, but you may get caught on it, too. You know, it's a, or a chain link, Raise for that matter. Raise, raise it. <laughs> Broken bottles glued to the top of it. You know, I, Anthony, I feel your pain. Every development I've done, I've had a running battle with og &E to try to do something with these transformers. No exception. And I don't know what the solution is, but I think, as you say, some higher power needs to be involved in this because I think they're I, uh, as wonderful as our designs are and um, and the direction our city's going from a design and use standpoint I think is fabulous, but I think these things are a blight. And I have no answer for that. I have done my dead level best to address this. Having said that, you're on the horns of a dilemma here. You've got to put a transformer somewhere, and, and within our lifetime, I'm not sure this is going to change. So I think the design these guys have done is great. I think it's with the limited options that were available, uh, they've come up with a good idea, and I and I support this design in spite of the fact that I hate transformers. I mean, I I agree that this case, the whole situation, kind of troubles me, and I don't I don't want to stop development of a building downtown. Like I think that that's great by saying you can't put a transformer in a park or being against that, but. So og &E said there was no way you could put it in a vault in your building like that was just off the table? Yes. We looked at several locations within the building, and there was no place to construct an internal vault that would meet their criteria. Um, they're not willing to put it in the street. Yeah. Um, I also kind of hate it in the street. And I, see, I also see them walking around all over downtown and midtown, and I 
don't like them. I just, I don't know enough about, yeah, I feel like I don't know enough about the situation to. And just to be clear, we're not here to ask for your permission to put it in the park. That's already been granted. Oh, it's just the design of the park. Okay. We're, we're here to well, ask about like the design of the park. It's just about the design of that thing. Tim, I will ask the question, was, was a vault within the park considered? Uh, it was. Uh, Ogini said they could not do it with the depth of their fiber that already exists and some main spine running up and down. There's not enough room on either side of it within the park curbs to put a vault big enough to meet their criteria. Okay. I just have one. Final comment, which is, I do not trust OG&E as far as I could throw. This is the easy solution for OG&E, and it is all over downtown. So, uh, my, with my hand on my heart, I would prefer to see the transformer in the street and the park slick. I agree with. Um, the concern with transformers and, and coordination with OG&E, uh, I think what's being presented in front of us is a very nice solution to dealing with it. Um, and I appreciate uh, the, the owner um, taking responsibility for the park, both for the, the design and the maintenance. I agree with that also, and I feel like we're getting close to saying, well, OG is going to do it for us again. But before we do that, I've got a real concern. I can see somebody climbing over that thing in a second. I think I could even do it myself. And I think that maybe we should relook at that outside to make sure that, I mean, that would be easier to climb than a chain especially if the openings are that big, which is what a chain link fence is. And anyone except me climb a chain link fence. Um, we could probably tighten those letters up, but I guess our concern was, is that going to defeat the appearance of, you know, the lighting, the, the effect at night? And that was kind of a big thing. You know, it's, this is a, a very decorative element and, um, but we could look at, you know, narrowing the letters. Um, the LEDs are pretty high powered, um, 17 watt, you know, one foot strips all the way around the top. So, uh, so could you put the smooth panel on the outside and the cut panel on the inside? You wouldn't be able to, I'm not following that yet. Yeah. So, so I think anybody can climb anything. So maybe what you do is to protect idiots from themselves and put a little ladder inside so they can get out if they get in. Yeah, that's um, pretty easy to do. I, I mean, you can't. You can build a 30-foot wall and somebody can get over it. So, um, that would be my safety solution for someone that got in. We can do that. And is the parks okay with this, or is this liability then go to Pioneer? Linda McMillan Miller, Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation Department. I'm sorry, Connie, could you repeat your question? Well, I, I guess when you have people hanging out and partying inside this thing, is this going to be a pioneer responsibility or a city of the park? Well, with the pioneer uh, building owner agreeing to make, do all maintenance on the park, it would be their responsibility for security also of the park. Add to that real quick is uh, the Parks Department has a standard agreement they enter into when anybody, uh, whenever a private individual maintains a public park, and it includes a language for uh, security, maintenance, etc. And and we've worked all that out and it's standing by to go to council it has to be accepted by the council. We can't go to council without your approval. Do we have any other discussion or questions? I, I was just going to address the issue of being able to look down it. If you're on 
in any high-rise building downtown. You, you look down and see all sorts of ugly things on rooftops. That's just part of it. I would say that the trees around there may block that. So I, I, I understand the concern, but I think that's going to probably be a better solution than, what, than other views that we have from downtown. I, the issue, actually, I thought of the latter as well, I've got to tell you. If they're going to, and you know they are, there's going to be homeless, and there are going to be teenagers that scale that wall just because it's there, uh, homeless because they, they need that protection. I had actually also thought, well, we've got to give them a way out. If we know they're going to do that, it sounds silly, but I think Chuck might actually be correct in that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think otherwise I, it's a good design. It's, it's, it's an eyesore right now, the park is. I go by that all the time. Nobody uses it. They're going to go to Kerr Park, actually, to use it. So um, if it presents uh, a better entrance into that area of downtown, I'm, I, think it, I think this plan does achieve that. So I'm going to make a motion. Are you ready uh, to approve this application that meets the design guidelines, the downtown design? Would you? With the uh, provision, they put a little ladder inside. So I believe we have a Ainsworth Kriegel motion. All those in favor? Aye. All opposed? Application is approved. Thank you. That concludes items for individual consideration. We have no other business. Um, we have our administrative approval report. Are there any comments from staff? The only comment is we do have a meeting next month. Okay. We have several cases, and you, there's probably you've probably seen articles in the paper. So we've got some big projects coming in. Okay, looking forward to it. Any comments from the committee? Okay, well, our next meeting will be Thursday, May 17th, 2018. New applications were to be submitted to staff by 4 p.m. on Tuesday, April 17th. And revisions and information on continued projects submitted April 24th, 2018. Thank you, everyone. Meeting is adjourned.